to it. And uh, basically trying to train your hearts to, to, to understand the meaning, to sing together. And I'm just curious as to what it might do. And uh, if you haven't heard the message, uh, just so that you can kind of get on board, um, you, you, you know, there's, and you missed the Academy of Arts, uh, you can watch it uh, on uh, YouTube, which I think it's number 25. It's the last one, just the last worth it, whatever it is. So, uh, uh, But anyway, I just want to encourage you to uh, meditate on all of those hymns. And if you didn't get a sheet, it's in the back. Um, but uh, I also wanted to make sure that I... Uh, uh, told you about the Better Together. Don't forget about that, okay? Uh, you know, I don't just, you know, put these Sunday school lessons together for my health. You know, it's uh, it's really supposed to be a design to make us better together. So I really would appreciate it if all of you would just try to make it at 10 o'clock. We do show the uh, early edition at 9.45. You can fix a cup of coffee while that's going if you want to. It's no big deal. Uh, it's something that I show even if nobody's here. So... Um, I just uh, wanted to make sure that all those things are available to you. Also, don't forget about our visitation program that we have uh, every Saturday. And uh, so if you're interested in that work, right now we're just kind of canvassing and just trying to reach as many people as we can. Not a whole lot of door knocking and things like that involved. Every now and then somebody will come to the door and open it because they've got those sensors now. And uh, so uh, you might get surprised every now and then. But Really, right now, my mission is to just make sure that every person in the town gets a door hanger. And uh, so uh, we've really done well with that so far. The devil's really opposed us, but uh, I do want to encourage you to do that. And I also want to show you our introduct uh, introductory video for the parables. I've got something like that together for, for uh, us to see. And I, I try to advertise this as well to try and get people to come to church. So here you go. to the shepherd rescuing his sheep, uh, we don't think about the fact that he might have had to go through water and storms to get that thing back, and it's just really a, a dynamic illustration of God's love for us. But take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke again this evening, and we'll, uh, we'll be looking at a parable that is likely familiar to most of the world. Um, You'll hear the name Good Samaritan in the movies. You'll hear it in common talk. Uh, houses all around us were built by a group known as Samaritan's Purse. Um, 
which, if I'm not mistaken, was started by Franklin Graham, or was it Billy Graham? I'm not sure which one it was, but anyway. Um, uh, but as acquainted with the story as we all are, there's many who don't quite understand the exact meaning of the story. We don't look deep enough, and this is not to say that every, everything that you've heard before is wrong, per se. You know, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm digging a little bit deeper um, into the parables. There's so much that we can learn out of the parables. Um, uh, it's just that the full meaning of the story is not often conveyed from the pulpits. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to let you in on the life of a pastor for just a second. And uh, this may give you some insight on how to pray for me, of course, but uh, uh, I assure you that this is a concept formulated in the minds of pastors throughout the world. Uh, but as much as I love to preach, and as much as this is my calling, and what I'd rather be doing more than anything else, um, it's why I turned down other things, other careers that I had wanted to do. I turned all those things down for that. There's times when I am preparing a sermon and I think to myself, why am I doing this? And there just come times as a pastor where I, I ask myself, why am I, why am I getting the sermon ready? Um, you know, why, why do these people that are my spiritual family, why is it that they come to New Grace Baptist Church and actually tolerate me twice on Sundays and once on Wednesday? And, uh, you know, as I said already, I'm, I'm not the only pastor that's really thought this way. And uh, because of this, there's many pastors who come to the conclusion that the people are not really valuing the Word of God. And so why should he? Um... And, you know, I, I'm just telling you that this is a tactic of Satan, but it's a common conclusion that a lot, a lot of pastors come to, and they just, they'll find whatever they're familiar with and preach on. Um, whether you value what is uh, preached up here or not, it's valuable to me. The things that I've prepared for you, it's something that's of value to me. I think it's a matter, of, I think it's a thing of value that I want to make sure that I share with you. I found something that's golden and I want to share it with you. I'm not just going to find something and just throw it at you. I'm going to tell you something that I think is valuable. Valuable enough to continue my search with no concern of what I'll preach next. It just <laughs> comes every Sunday. In many cases, God prepares my heart three weeks in advance. Oh. Um, I don't study the Bible to prepare a sermon, but to prepare my own heart before the Lord. Um, and it just so happens that many times I get a message out of it. Uh, people ask, ask me why I write my own curriculum for Better Together. You know, for that series. Why? Why would I do that when only four show up some days? Um, it's no effort on my part. I mean, I don't consider it an effort on my part. Uh, I consider that I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, and when I do, uh, all that I need to teach you, whether you come or not, comes with very little effort. I mean, that's kind of how I look at it. Um, is there effort in reaching that point? Yeah, there's effort in reaching that point. There's a lot of work that's put into it, but such effort is spent on, what, on discovering what's going to help me first. Uh, to see if it works. My own life is a full experiment of, the, of God's Word, just trying it out, experiencing it for myself, and then sharing it with you. Um, and uh, when I've found what works for my walk, the talk just comes easy. Um, what I'm saying is I realize that sometimes my preaching can have quite a bit of depth in it. I realize that. And uh, many times I'll make you think. And... Um, some of what I say is going to leave you thinking, well, that sounds right. Seems to fit my soul's need, but why haven't I heard it before? I've had some people say, I haven't heard some of the stuff that you're up here saying before. Um, either that or you just don't get it at all. There might be times where you don't get the preaching at all. Um, is, is there something that is helping you up here? Ask a question. You know, it's, it's good for you to ask a question. It's good for you to ask for further guidance. That's what the parables are all about. I'm really just trying to help you to understand this whole thing about the parables. I'm trying to prompt you and help you. I have several of you coming to me, and you do ask me. You ask me about things. Um, you know, Pastor, I think I'm understanding the Spirit-filled life. Can you uh, kind of talk to me a little more about this so that I can make sure that I'm getting it right? 
And, you know, I'll, I'll help you along the way. The fact is, is wisdom activates the Holy Spirit. Knowledge kind of stabilizes it a whole lot more. And that's why you see wisdom and then knowledge in Colossians. Uh, I, I've experienced the Spirit-filled life and didn't even realize that I was experiencing it. Um, but, uh, you know, I realize that I'm going a little long with what I'm saying here. But um, if, if your surroundings are not very convincing, it could be that you are not convincing to your surroundings. All right? Uh, you know, are you convinced of God in all that's around you? Uh, make sure that you're convincing your surroundings. Make sure that they see God in you. That's ultimately the point. That's the goal for you. Um, I'll just illustrate. Um, how many of you believe that Jesus was filled with peace while he was in the boat asleep in the storm? Amen. Okay, yeah. I, I do. Uh, he was not faking it. He was actually asleep, which means that peace flooded his heart. Uh, and that can be the, the solitary reason why he was able to command peace to his surroundings, to the winds and to the waves, because he was full of it. If you're convinced that souls can still be saved, if you're truly convinced that souls can still be saved and are being saved, you'll see souls saved. Uh, you can't pin it on the pastor. You can't say, well, you know, I, I've, I've had people in the church in the past, they've confronted me, they've, they've met with me, you know, on a Friday evening or something, you know, they called me in for a secret meeting, something that I had no idea what they were going to talk to me about, and, the, and I, I thought, oh boy, what did I do this time? They come, they come in and they go, how come people aren't getting saved? How come people aren't coming to church? And they look at me like it's my fault. And uh, the fact is, is uh, it, it's, it's something that cannot be tacked on to anything but our apathy as a whole uh, to the truth of God's Word. We may not be seeing much happening, but the Word of God says that things are happening. They're happening through the world. Souls are still being saved in the world today. Uh, we need to trust the Word and, and not the world. Don't let, uh, don't, let your surrounding, don't let your surroundings dictate whether coming to church faithfully is worth it or not. You know why? Because the world's going to convince you that it's not worth it. See, you can't let your surroundings dictate that. You can't say, well, nobody else is doing it. Um, you can't let that influence you. Um, but the fact is, it is worth it. You be the one. You be the one to make a difference. Don't wait for someone else to come along and do it. Initiate a prayer meeting. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not always up to the pastor. Uh, you know, just say, Pastor, I'd like to be sure that the doors are open at such and such a time. Uh, on this particular day, and I'd like for you to announce a prayer meeting for me. Uh, now, I, I just want to make sure that this is straight with you. You know, that does not mean that I have to be there in order for you to have that prayer meeting. I can just make sure that the doors are locked. It might be that there's something that I have to do. It, it, it is not, it's not critical that the pastor is there. Uh, in fact, some of the greatest prayer meetings that have ever taken place were when the pastor wasn't there. Sometimes some of the greatest prayer meetings involve two widow ladies praying together uh, behind closed doors. Um, honestly, I think there, in some cases I tend to hinder the meeting. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to provoke, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some people feel intimidated in my presence. And I'm, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not blaming you for that. I'm not, you know, I, I, I get it, you know, but you don't need to be. But the thing is, is that I'm not the key to seeing us initiate prayer meetings, to get involved, to try and get things going ourselves. It's, it's not up to, you know, the pastor is supposed to equip you. Um, but, uh, you know, Harrison pulls me to the back every Sunday, every Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. Hey, Dad, you want to come pray? Special meetings, funerals. I mean, he says, Dad, you want to have a prayer meeting before the funeral starts? I mean, we, we, whenever it comes to a meeting that deals with the gospel, Harrison's pulling me back there, asking me to pray. And when, we're, when I'm not there, he finds somebody to pray with. Harrison initiates prayer meetings. Um, you know, it's a much better thing to watch the fire fall upon New Grace Baptist Church after you were the one to pray for that fire than it would be knowing that you didn't pray for that fire when it does come. 
um, seeing that it was for real and that it came despite your unbelief. Um, I'm just telling you the truth here. And, and I'm really applying this to the story of the Good Samaritan. That's really what we're looking at, all right? Um, but recently, I have found it easier not to care than to care. I mean, I found it easier. Am I saying that I don't care? I'm not saying that. I'm saying I found it easier not to care than to care. And if you're not careful, having an attitude like that will cause you not to care about not caring. <laughs> what a dreadful place to be. To not even care about not caring. Have you ever heard somebody say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired? How about hearing a guy that says, I really don't care that I don't care? That's a terrible place to be. Uh, everywhere we turn today, it's as cold as ice. It's as hard as stone, as hard as flint, as parched as cracked earth. And we're living in a world where it looks better to dry up than it is to flourish. Um, we're living in a world where men are lovers of their own selves, where per perilous times have come. Perilous times aren't coming, they're here. Uh, where man is devising ways to get off the planet entirely in search of something that doesn't even exist. Or at least won't exist until Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years. Stephen Hawking, and I'm sure that some of you have heard of this guy. He said that we have a hundred years to get off this planet. Well, I guess Elon Musk is trying to do that. I guess he took his word for it because he's trying to get that starship ready. But at the rate he's going with that starship, I doubt many of us will be alive before we ever get a chance to colonize another planet. It's ridiculous. I mean, we're not doing too well. Uh, we're so full of ourselves today. We really are. We are so full of self. There is a new planet on the horizon. Stephen Hawking is right about this earth burning up. I mean, he, he, he's right. But the Bible already predicted that. He's wrong about building a spaceship in order to preserve the human race. I mean, he's totally wrong about that. God already made a, he waited, he made a way for us to inhabit a brand new earth. It's through his son, and it doesn't involve status. It doesn't involve wealth. It doesn't involve popularity. You don't have to be... Uh, you, you don't have to be the owner of Amazon to get into a spaceship and take off. I heard that 40,000 plus people have signed a petition saying they don't want that guy to be back. I think that's, I think that's hilarious. That's kind of scary if you ask me. I wouldn't want to be him. You know. But uh, while Hawking is burning in a lake of fire, I'm going to be enjoying that perfect planet that, that he could have only dreamed of. Simply because I chose to put my faith in a creator God, as opposed to a bunch of man-made theories, see? And uh, my faith in a living God, it comes from the living book. Right. That's where it comes from. And the book has words that will never pass away. Never. Right. Long after I'm gone, the words are going to still be here. The things that I'm sharing with you will still be here. I'm going to tell you, the church has got to stop acting like the rest of this dying, lost, dried up world. And start living like there's another home waiting for us. We really need to start acting like that. We need to control our surroundings by letting the God of everything control us. That's what we need to do. That's what this story is all about, the Good Samaritan. You know... You know, this is just kind of an intro to that story because I'm going to cover some more stuff later. But it's all about changing the world one dying person at a time. That's what it's about. And then teaching them how to change the world and how to be even more effective than we were when we reached them. That's what this is all about. That's what this story is about. Do we care anything about that? Doesn't matter if you're excited or not. Doesn't matter if you don't even care. We're talking about people that are slipping into hell faster than the sands going through an hourglass. They are slipping into hell one by one faster than that. Are we willing to pour our expenses into their wounds? Are we willing to pay for what they need and even extra for more if they need that? And I'm not talking about money. <laughs> America's got plenty of money. 
Uh-oh. The majority of beggars in this country only want money for drugs and alcohol. I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. It's really what this is about. Uh, some of these guys that are on the streets make a living. They make a, they make a strong living off of holding up a sign. They get about $60,000 a year. That's what I've seen. They're not dying physically like the people in third world countries. Here's a guy. This is a real beggar. You don't see that in America. Uh, I, don't, I don't see people like that on the side of the road holding up signs that say, I'm poor, I have no money, can you help me? I don't see that. Uh, I think that we'd know a true beggar if we ever saw one, but more than half of us in here have never been outside of the country to really know for sure what a beggar really is. Um, what's interesting before COVID, that is, I have seen people that look like that beggar in rest homes. Oh, Harrison, you can change it there. That's my friend, Mr. Moody. Mr. Moody always would shake my hand. Do you remember Mr. Moody? Yeah. You guys remember him? Mr. Moody always would shake my hand. He'd grab it real tight, and he'd look at me, and he'd go, he'd go, Preacher, thank you so much for coming and preaching to me. He goes, when are you coming back? <laughs> he'd give me this look, when are you coming back? Sure. Yeah, 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 right, right. Every now and then, he, he says, he said, give me a new shirt. And I'd go, I'd bring him a new shirt, and then the next time he'd go, bring me two shirts. <laughs> so we'd bring, him, we'd bring him a new shirt. I'm not even sure if he ever wore that shirt, but you know, that guy, do you think he really remembered me the next time I saw him? Yeah. Not really. You know, he had Alzheimer's, he was forgetting. Miss Molly there with her little bunny ears. I miss those people. I know that uh, Miss Lisa, she's still, she's still struggling with the loss of her grandmother. You know, I'm going to tell you, it costs to see those kinds of people right there. Um, but that's too expensive. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, it doesn't cost a dime to go there. It just costs time. You can give a $10 bill to a guy holding a sign up on the side of the road. That doesn't really cost you hardly anything. But this costs you time. It costs a bit of energy. It costs a lot of love. Uh, I still miss Mr. Moody. That was my that was my pal. A bit of heartache. Heartache is part of the cost of love. See, heartache is what you pay when you love somebody. See, America's got money, but they're bankrupt when it comes to time. They're bankrupt when it comes to answers about real pain, about real problems. We're bankrupt when it comes to compassion. And we feel like we don't have enough to pour into them because we fail to be filled by an indispensable, inexhaustible, immutable God. We fail to, on a regular basis, we fail to be filled with Him so that we can do that. Without Him, we can't afford that kind of love. We can't afford that kind of effort. We fail to grasp the concept that God Almighty spent the greatest, most invaluable currency to save the lost, to save us, and that's blood. That's the most invaluable currency there is. It doesn't inflate. Praise God for that. And so we spend the lesser kind. Green paper. Oh, a beggar likes green paper, especially in America. They love the green paper. It's what affords him another bottle to chase away the blues in his life. You know, he'll take your green paper to forget how he lost everything he had because of what you can't afford to tell him, that he's a sinner, that sin is what made him like that, and that no green will save him. Only red, only blood, only Jesus will save him. See? But pastor, they're not listening. You know, people aren't listening today. I just, I don't see why we should go out and talk to people because they're not listening. And I go back to what I started with in the message. Remember what I started with in the message? Suppose I said that about my sermons. Uh, you know, suppose I settled back on passages of scripture that I understand and that are easy on the grounds that you people don't listen to me anyway. <laughs> of course, that's of the devil. That's hogwash. Oh, you know, I don't believe it. I do believe you listen. I, 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 I know you do. Just as much as I know that the Spirit lives and works in my heart and the things that I prepare, I know that you're listening, but 
That's not why I do it, though. That's not why I prepare a sermon. I do it because it's what God ordered. So people don't listen. So you don't really care. It doesn't matter. God told us to do it anyway. He told us to share the gospel anyway. If it means passing out a gospel tract, if it means hanging a door hanger, it means God said do it anyway. I was out on visitation Saturday. Cindy, as faithful as she is, she is now having to wait to find out what her insurance is going to cover for a little fender bender that we had trying to reach every creature in Tarboro. I guess she should quit because of that. See, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know who can make it out and who can. It's really none of my business. But if you can and you don't, I guess you ought to tell her that it's not worth that to tell the lost. Um, you know, not, not one person will come to church over that anyway. You know, why, why are you out there wasting your time? Why'd you risk your life? Why'd you risk your kid's life to get out the gospel and make sure everybody gets a track? We pulled up to some of the wildest houses on Main Street because I want to make sure everybody gets something. Was it because of my own burden? No, it was because Jesus said, make sure everybody gets something. Uh, should she quit? Never. Miss Cindy, who can hardly walk, faithfully out there trying to win the lost, it's not worth it. Pass that bloody flux of a sinner on the street, it's not worth it. Now you have to decide what is worth it. You know, you have to decide how, how don't forget how far God reached out for you, you know. And, uh, you know, like I said, there's going to come a time in our lives where we really don't care. There's going to come a time in our life where we're saying nobody's listening. There's going to come a time in our life when it seems like nobody's moving. But that doesn't mean we're supposed to quit. That's what a good Samaritan is. See, that's who Jesus was for us. And uh, we'll, we'll look a little bit more into the actual parable next time. But, uh, but uh, let's go ahead and... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and take down prayer requests right now, and, and, um, and then we'll pray together, okay? So do I have any, any prayer requests? Anybody? Judd? The Lord will help me to witness to my piano teacher. Yes, yes, amen. That's good. You know, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good example of a connection, Judd. Uh, I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for watching this broadcast. If you have any questions about the message or would like to chat in any way, we would love to connect with you. You can message us on Messenger and we will get you in touch with the right people. I also want to invite you to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ personally. To make Jesus your own personal Savior. Friend, if this message has helped you understand the gospel, that you cannot earn your way to heaven, that there is no way to achieve your salvation, if you've understood today that salvation is a gift from God and all you can do is receive it by faith, then why don't you act on the promise of God? Why don't you claim the truth that Jesus Christ himself said that whosoever would believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life? Wherever you may be right now, I hope that you will bow your head and heart before God and place your faith in Jesus Christ. Tell him that you want him to be your personal savior. He will come into your life. He'll be a savior, a father, and a faithful friend. And he'll change you beginning today. To find out more about this decision, I encourage you to message us or go to the link below me, bit.ly slash pandemic 323 to learn more. And I want to thank you again so much for taking part in this broadcast. And I hope to see you next time.